Hi, everybody. Could uh, folks please uh, go ahead and grab a seat? I'd uh, like to welcome everybody to our Kubernetes Zone uh, panel and reception. We're going to uh, try and entertain you for a couple minutes here and then uh, let you grab some more drinks. Uh, my name is Dan Kahn. I'm the executive director of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And uh, I'm thrilled to have a little uh, uh, bit of uh, Kubernetes history here. I'm uh, definitely the neophyte uh, on the stage. So I'll let the uh, other panelists introduce themselves and uh, talk through how kind of uh, their introduction to Kubernetes and what they've been up to. Thanks, Dan. Uh, my name is Tim Hawken. I'm, I've been with the Kubernetes project uh, basically from the beginning. Uh, I work at Google. Uh, I came from the Borg world at Google, so I worked on our internal cluster systems, and I'm bringing some of that experience to the Kubernetes project. Uh, I mostly work in networking, storage, uh, and sort of lower level pieces of the Kubernetes stack. Uh, that's where I spend most of my time. Hi, everyone. I'm Mackenzie. I am um, product manager at CoreOS, and my <clears throat> journey to Kubernetes, I started a company um, called Red Spread right out of college uh, two years ago and um, really focused on collaborative deployment. Uh, Docker was just, you know, sort of gaining a lot of traction, and Kubernetes came along and we sort of saw that as um, a lot of the, the future that we wanted to create, and so we built a company around that and then joined CoreOS. Um, about a year and a half later. Uh, my name is Craig. Uh, I've been on Kubernetes since the very beginning. Um, I was the product guy who helped uh, bring Kubernetes to market, working with Tim and a bunch of other awesome Google engineers. And more recently, I started a company, Heptio, to make upstream Kubernetes more accessible to enterprises everywhere. Um, great. Well, let me uh, go ahead and start with, uh, I kind of hate boring panels. Uh, so I'll just say, I mean, here we are the night before uh, DockerCon really kicks off, and um, it's been suggested that in 2015, DockerCon banned uh, the use of the K-word on stage. And uh, Tim is going to be on an actual panel, uh, not just the night before off-site, but uh, in DockerCon proper that I encourage everyone to go to 3.45 p.m. on uh, Wednesday. Um, and presumably will uh, speak the word Kubernetes at some point during the talk. So um, I guess I would ask you, is the industry maturing? Uh, are we finding a modus operandi for working together? Uh, how's uh, the relationship with Docker going? I guess that one's for me. <laughs> um, so that was the rumor. Uh, I don't know if there's any truth to it. Uh, it has been denied. Um, <laughs> But, uh, no, I do think the world uh, is in a much better place in 2017 than it was in 2015, specifically in this regard. I mean, if you look at the work that we've been doing in the last six months in particular, we've been working a lot with the Docker folks uh, on projects like Kubernetes uh, and projects like storage, this uh, container storage interface that we're working on. Uh, it's been fantastic to actually not uh, be angry at each other. Um, <laughs> You know, the, 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 the sniping has given way to actually fruitful conversations. Um, and it turns out that uh, they have some great engineers and some smart ideas. And so I'm very happy to be working with them on stuff. And, and I'm happy to be here uh, at DockerCon with the chance to represent the Kubernetes community within the Docker community. Um, I don't think Docker ever really forgave me for uh, sneakily announcing Kubernetes at DockerCon about three years ago. Um, and so I'll take this moment to apologize officially to Docker for uh, the way that we brought that about. You know, we didn't want to kind of pre-release the news, and so we kind of brought Kubernetes in on something that was a little bit of a nondescript uh, presentation. I think we, you know, Brennan and I did a presentation which was, you know, breaking down the barriers between PaaS and infrastructure service or containers or something like that. Um, and so I think, you know, they definitely got a little bit, um, you know, broadsided by that, and, and I think we all felt a little bit poorly about the way that that sort of worked out. Um, but I mean, what Tim said, I think that at the end of the day, we've seen so much maturity of this broader ecosystem. We've seen um, a remarkable sort of set of progress around these open initiatives. You know, Kubernetes is clearly at a tremendously open uh, container orchestration framework. Um, I think Docker has signaled very clearly that they're heading into open territory with things like Containerd. And so I'm very positive about the future. I actually think we've come a long way since uh, 
those already uncomfortable days of uh, whenever it was. Yeah, I'll just um, end uh, by saying that I think everyone benefits, both users and vendors in a community, when we have um, the perception or in the reality of a neutral playing field and when we're able to collectively work together toward open standards, um, that it, I think is something that benefits everyone and I think everyone in the ecosystem is realizing that. So uh, Kubernetes has only been open source for a couple years now and it's uh, evolving incredibly rapidly and we have uh, a ton of users out there that are asking for lots of features. Uh, I love this, uh, this question from Tim. Uh, what are the features that customers are demanding that should not be added into Kubernetes? And uh, why is that? Where to start? Uh, I mean, the, the space of things that people need to be productive, to use a system like Kubernetes um, for end-to-end -end is, is a huge space. <clears throat> I don't think Kubernetes is the uh, end all for every problem that every person is going to face in this space. I think there needs to be room for uh, the ecosystem to fill problems um, in opinionated ways. So Kubernetes tries to draw the boundaries of what it does uh, at this layer of, you know, we think everybody will probably need this. And that's sort of what we consider as our criteria for what we call part of Kubernetes. So what should not be in this core? I mean, there's a lot of things I think that are right at the edge of this. Uh, one that comes up frequently is things like templating or client side, um, like, like Turing complete configuration languages. Um, I think th those are places where opinions are very strong uh, and we shouldn't pick a, a, a one true answer to those sorts of things. Um, I also think when it comes to things like which load balancer you're going to use, is it Nginx or HAProxy or Envoy, uh, there's too many opinions and, and reasons really good reasons to choose one or another. Um, so I don't think we can choose one as the, the true answer. And so I think uh, that's a place where we just need to take our hands off. Yeah, I would, I would um, second a lot of what Tim said. I think it's, we were actually just in a discussion right before this around conformance testing, um, Craig, Dan and I, and <clears throat> it's a question that comes up, like what is, what, how can we design conformance tests that um, test for, you know, base Kubernetes if we collectively, you know, can't decide on what base Kubernetes is. Um, and that there's a lot of work toward that, hopefully toward 1.7 we'll be able to conclusively answer what, what is Kubernetes um, at its core. I think another example is like cloud provider support or platform support. These are, um, there's so many places that Kubernetes can, can be installed that building that into those opinions into core is often harmful um, for, for a number of reasons, but um, mostly just around um, enabling Kubernetes to run in more places, you wanna make sure that it's um, as neutral as possible to the underlying platform. So at the end of the day, I think a project is defined as much by what it's not as what it is. You know, and I think I said this to the team since the beginning, which is, um, hey, you know, we have to know what we're not. And to be able to enter a situation where you can say definitively the things that Kubernetes won't tackle, you really need to be able to define the boundaries of the system. And so from my perspective, um, you know, I think the, the key thing here is to make sure that we have very you know, crisp and clean boundaries between Kubernetes and this amazingly rich emerging ecosystem. So for instance, I love Helm. I think it's a great technology. It should not be part of Kubernetes. It should be an overlay that exists on top of it. Um, I think that the work that uh, CoreOS is doing is doing an amazing job of abstracting out workloads from the Kubernetes core. I don't think that we should be pushing any workload specific capabilities into the Kubernetes core. I look at things like PaaS systems and I believe you know, in my bones that Kubernetes should not be a PaaS, it should be a constituent piece for, for building PaaSes. Um, I'm even, like, I'll be honest, I'm not a huge fan of cluster federation right now. Like, I, I actually think that um, there's a decent amount of thought that needs to be given to where that needs to live as an abstraction. You know, should that be above Kubernetes or inside Kubernetes? And so I don't think you'll find anyone who's a bigger proponent of completing Kubernetes than me. Like this is a system that has tremendous amount of value. 
And at some point, we need to complete the set of interfaces. And of course, we'll evolve. I mean, the Linux kernel hasn't been complete. It continues to evolve as, as the ecosystem evolves. Um, but to be able to do that, I think it's going to need very clean boundaries between the adjacent subsystems. We need a common monitoring interface. We need a common s logging interface. We need a common storage interface. We already have a common networking interface. Thank you, Koros, again. Um, and uh, you know, we need to continue to sort of define those boundaries and then create opportunities for a wealth of new projects to emerge around those areas. Um, and then over time, the, the community will stabilize on, on what, the, what the right way to do things are. I think it was uh, 10 years ago that Andrew Morton, who was then the number two kernel developer, said that uh, he thought the kernel uh, would be finished in the next 12 or 24 months. And uh, if you look at the statistics, the change rate, the commit rate, all of those uh, have actually increased every version since then. Uh, and it's actually going faster. So uh, along those lines, if you look at uh, Kubernetes, of the 54 million projects on GitHub today, uh, Kubernetes, depending on how you count, is somewhere between number one and number 10 in terms of its development velocity. But unlike Linux with Linus Torvalds or uh, Docker with Solomon Hikes or say Python uh, with Guido von Rossum, there is no ben benevolent dictator for life. Um, and so uh, right now you have a, we'll call it a constitutional process going on. And uh, Tim, you're um, in say the Benjamin Franklin role, um, hopefully not one of the slave owners, uh, founding fathers. Um, so could you, um, actually could all three of you give us your view of that, uh, of that process and uh, how's it going and, uh, and uh, what we should be expecting from it? So the, the process has been going um, off and on for a couple of months, um, and we're really kicking it into high gear, uh, in fact, next week, um, when we get together for a, some very intensive face-to-face uh, -face discussions. Um, we here being mostly the founders of the project, uh, plus a couple other people from community, um, we, we sort of call ourselves the, the constitutional committee. Um, the goal is to answer some really fundamental questions about the project, right? Who's in charge and who said so? And what happens if I don't like that? Um, the project is big enough and broad enough that there's no way that one small group of people, uh, much less one BDFL, could make all the decisions about technology direction. So we need to find ways to delegate ownership, to delegate leadership. Um, we have this uh, special interest group structure with Kubernetes that works reasonably well, um, but it's a little bit ill-defined uh, what it's actually responsible for, what sort of decisions are SIG level decisions and what sort of decisions need uh, higher level approval or, or coordination. Um, so I think the really fundamental question that we need to answer is how do uh, a community member, how can you come to the project and file a, um, an issue that gets some heated debate and if you don't like the answers and the decisions that are being made, how, how does that escalate, right? Or if the community decides that I'm doing a terrible job, uh, how do they replace me? Right? I hope that never happens, but I'd like to be sure that it's possible. I think um, the way that I, the, something that I've been thinking about, um, especially today from our, the meeting with um, conformance testing is how, that I think we do a very good job as a community of involving vendors in the discussion of, of what Kubernetes should be, what Kubernetes is, what Kubernetes should become um, and the maintenance, the maintenance of the project. I think we are getting better at, but have a lot of room to improve in terms of end users who are involved in participating in the project and the decisions being made. And oftentimes vendors come to the table as, represent, uh, as representatives of the end user. And I would love um, if you know a lot of the companies that um, vendors are working with, the partners in the ecosystem, um, if there was a way to, I guess, make getting involved a little bit more accessible or we could work collectively to make sure that they're at the table as well. I don't have a lot to add other than, um, you know, a statement of support for, for what Tim said. I think that the strength of Kubernetes is primarily grounded in its openness. I think that one of the things that we can, you know, squarely point and attribute a lot of the success of the project to was the fact that it was very accepting of other folks. I mean, if you look at the role that Red Hat has played in the evolution of Kubernetes, uh, it's been considerable. You know, um, Tim and Brian and 
Brennan and Joe and all of the guys that were sort of you know building it out initially um, were really good Google engineers, um, but they weren't necessarily enterprise engineers. And having people like you know Clayton Coleman and Tim Sinclair and a bunch of the other Red Hat folks come into the fold really changed the game. You know, it it made it a much better project. Um, and I, I think it would be a real shame if the project calcified. I think it would be a real shame if we got to a point where it was really just the set of folks that really did the in initial kind of uh, setup that became the folks that would be able to drive it you know, in perpetuity. I think there needs to be an opportunity for someone like um, Brennan from CoreOS, who's you know, one of the best distributed systems engineers on the planet, to become an in, you know, integral part of it. Or the next generation guys who are coming out of college you know, move into those roles. And so, you know, I don't have much to say other than I'm comprehensively and completely supportive of creating a really principled and structured program. I like the idea of a meritocracy where you're not a, a BDFL because you initiated this. You have an opportunity to rise to the ranks and, you know, by merit and contribution and, and strength of what you do, uh, step into a role of authority on the project. Um, I have trust in the congressional, you know, folks who are setting this process up. And I'm looking forward to hearing the outcome. Yeah, the other piece I'd add on uh, moving up is just the reality for any open source project is that people also need the ability to move into an emeritus role, that, that folks do burn out and, or they just move on to other projects. And, and you need to have a process to allow them to do that or else uh, there's never an ability for new people to come up. Yeah, and I guess I'll just add that I think the success of any project or community or company comes uh, fortunately or unfortunately, but it, it often comes from when, after the fact, we see the pa passage to the next generation. And so, um, sort of in line with what everyone has been saying here, I think we'll really be able to see if we've set up a successful governance structure, if it can successfully be passed on to more people. I think the, the measure of success that I'm looking for is if we get it wrong, we have a framework by which we can do it again. Yeah, and I think that, that iteration concept really is kind of the whole point of open source and a lot of what we're doing here. Um, so I'm gonna ask one more question and then I, I'd encourage folks to uh, raise their hand. I think there's a microphone available and we'd love to have some uh, audience questions. Um, this one's a, a little subtle, but I, I think it, uh, we have a pretty technical audience here. So um, particularly for Tim, uh, where I know you've been uh, very involved with um, the Container D Summit and uh, working with Docker on that. And uh, the sort of high-level question is, how good a fit is Container D as a runtime for Kubernetes? But um, the more specific part of that is, how big is the distance right now from the 1.13 branch that I guess I understand is shipping as the upstream component in Docker today, and then the master branch that is gonna be the basis of development going forward? So, to the first part, Containerd, uh, I think, is custom built for what we need in Kubernetes, right? It, its boundaries align exactly with what we want from a container runtime, which is, you know, frankly, Docker 1.0 with all the cool bug fixes and none of the higher level stuff, right? Um, and so Containerd gives us exactly that. Um, it's not done yet. Um, but I think that it's going to fit really well. We've got this uh, runtime abstraction within Kubernetes called the container runtime interface, uh, which is just Kubelet's way of talking to different runtimes. Um, we started the work of porting container D into that, uh, and it seems to fit very well. Uh, with respect to the difference between Docker 113 and container D, um, I think it's, there is some distance and it's growing uh, because the container D team have an opportunity to fix some of the wrongs before. Um, it's rare as a software engineer that you get to rebuild something uh, and you get to come back and say, I've learned my lessons, let me see what I can do to fix it. Part of, the, part of why Kubernetes is really interesting to me. Um, so I think that there's some of that going on, um, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I think it's, it's a good thing to be able to learn our lessons um, and to be able to do things more cleanly. Um, but it does mean that there's difference, right? And difference is always risky. Um, and I think that there's gonna be some time period over the next six to 12 months where container D falls down in places that Docker doesn't um, because things will have changed in ways that you know, we mere humans can't have predicted. Um, I'm not close enough to this to, to 
I don't want to pretend that I, you know, have a decisive opinion on this. I will say, though, that I'm really excited um, by the work that's being done um, with Container D and Kubernetes and um, with the donation of Container D and Rocket to the CNCF. Um, really, um, you know, happy that the, like we touching on the very first question that you had on, um, you know, a sign that, that we're moving toward a neutral market that um, gives ultimately is about user choice um, and gives users the opportunity to choose um, the container engine that works best for them. I'm incredibly encouraged, encouraged by, you know, what I've seen so far. Um, I think it's it's too early to really call it, but you know, to, to, to Tim's point, everything shows strong that container D is actually going to be a great solution for us. Um, as I look to the next six months, there's a couple of things I'll be looking very carefully at. Um, the first is going to be the health of the contributor model. You know, can we, as a community, through the container D initiative, achieve the types of committer velocities or contributor velocities that we've seen on projects like Kubernetes? Um, and if that is true. I think that it will be a you know tremendously powerful and you know effective force in the community, and that will then create a, a, a question that I think Doc is going to have to think through pretty carefully, which is um, which side of this open, multi-vendor, thermonuclear-powered ecosystem do you want to be on? And I think there's a pretty clear answer that you know, if we can get the committer model right, if we can actually tap into the same mode of force that created the project that is Kubernetes, uh, it's just a tremendously powerful thing, and I actually think that will benefit Docker tremendously. I mean, there's a lot of issues, uh, as Tim mentioned, that are being kind of you know, rethought and redirected. Um, there are still some issues that I hope we will be able to, as a community, uh, work our way through. There's some, still, still some design issues that I think need to be figured out. Um, but um, I think so much is going to be determined in the next six months. And a lot of it's going to be determined by you know, who's contributing, how they're contributing, how efficient is that system, and uh, what is the overall velocity of the project. But I get to uh, use my benefit as a panel moderator here to ask a follow-up. And uh, so I'll give my shout-out here to Chris Anschek and uh, all the folks who've worked so hard on the uh, Open Container Initiative and um, look specifically at Rocket now. And so when you say that there is a significant distance between Container D and uh, upstream Docker, then it does ask the question of doesn't that uh, potentially provide an opening for Rocket? And to say that uh, with CRI, um, could you talk about uh, the potential then for Rocket to step in uh, as that solution? So Rocket and Containerd both were donated to CNCF at the same time. Um, I think that's um, brilliant. I think Rocket, I mean, let's be honest, Rocket is a large part of the reason why uh, Docker was forced to evolve in certain directions over the last couple of years, right? Competition is a good thing, right? Solomon is on record saying this many, many times. Competition is a good thing for the consumer. It does, it does bring out the best in the product. Um, so I think it would be a shame for something like Rocket to go away. So I'm happy to see that Rocket has a life. Um, I would really love to see Rocket and Containerd both work in Kubernetes. Um, I think they have differences of opinion in some regards, and I think that they're very similar in other regards, but I think that they both solve the problem well. Um, Container D has some, some advantages, um, less technically and more um, positionally, I'm not sure that's a word, but uh, Container D exists on every Docker machine out there, right? And one of the issues we face with Kubernetes is, is I have a machine, I just want to try this Kubernetes thing out, right? And if our first step is delete Docker, install Rocket, or delete Docker, install Container D. That's a that's a bad first step. Whereas the plan with Container D is we'll be able to coexist with Docker on a machine. Right? It might not be the optimal thing that you want to do in production, but it's good enough for you to kick the tires and figure out what this thing is all about. And I think that's really powerful. Um, in addition to that, you have all of these people today who are using Docker, who are beating on Docker. That code base is tested and exercised and pretty well vetted, um, modulo all the things that uh, Steve's changing. Um, but uh, I think that that has a real powerful advantage um, for Containerd. Uh, but I don't think Rocket should go away, right? I think it would be really bad if, if Rocket went away. The same way that, and don't laugh, uh, BSD keeps Linux honest. Um, you know, there are some things that happen in the BSD market that make Linux better, right? Um, and I think that that's important. 
Am I expected to comment here? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I think the reason why we ended up, you know, donating, you know, Rocket and um, to the CNCF is just like, you know, we've we've talked about is that we're committed to um, building a community that gives users ultimate choice in terms of um, how they want to um, package their applications. And the reasons why we started Rocket, you know, were because um, we did want to push the um, container standards toward a direction where we felt um, as though that would be the best, um, the most secure, and the um, ultimately give the, the end user the best um, set of choices. And so I would say that, you know, I think maintaining a, a system that is um, pr provides all, a, a lot of different options for the users that all focus on um, CRI as a standard is a really good idea. So for me, I think it really comes down to um, security. At the end of the day, when you look at what the broader community has done to get Docker um, and the underlying runtime to a point where a lot of the very large banks and financial service institutions will adopt it as a mainstream production technology. That is no small thing. It's not a trivial feat. That took a tremendous amount of, of work and effort. And um, it's difficult to replicate that in, a, in another stack unless there's a huge driving factor. Um, now, when I look at Rocket, and I look at the architecture, which is in many ways more principled and, and better thought out than you know um, the, the Docker infrastructure, because they got to kind of take take a fresh look at it and really think about it from first principles. Um, there are some opportunities to do some highly differentiated things, uh, but until I saw a capability that was spectacularly differentiated uh, in terms of either improving the security posture by having you know a secure chain of trust uh, available up through that technology, or a performance profile, or something else—it's um, a—it's a tough—it's a, tough, a tough call. I just—I uh, just don't see the community rallying around doing what they did with Docker again. It was just a lot of work. Okay. Do I have anyone uh, who'd like to ask a question for the panel? Or uh, can I, Katie, can we come up to the front row, please? Uh, one of the questions that I hear a great deal about... Sorry, who, who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. Is Sardari Yegudlaub with InfoWorld? Hi there. <laughs> uh, one of the questions that I hear a great deal asked about uh, Kubernetes um, is how it's, uh, how it's supposed to shape up vis-a-vis -vis Docker Swarm. And one of the stock answers to that is, well, Swarm is what you do when you want to do quick and dirty, and Kubernetes is what you only want to get work done. And that was you know, slightly an exaggeration, but I think there's a grain of truth to that. And what I wanted to get is... Uh, your p point of view on where the two are supposed to stand out, not just now, but also as things go forward. I mean, this is a, I mean, this is a long story, right? Um, uh, Docker Swarm isn't like one thing, what hasn't been one thing through the history of time. Um, you know, when, when I started conversations with Docker and Ben and those folks back in the day around Kubernetes, um, the perspective on it was something quite different. The intent was to take the single node multiplexer and extend it out, but basically multiplex it out of multiple nodes. So to preserve the basic interface that you would have when launching a single container and then just spread it over a number of um, other containers. Kubernetes brings something that's, that's fundamentally different. It looks at the idea of creating an abstraction that represents a collection of machines as logical infrastructure. And much of it is powered by the constructs of things like pods, label selectors, um, you know, the service abstractions, et cetera. And I think that as you've seen the community rally around this technology, it's pretty clear that those abstractions are, are good. They've largely stood the test of time, relatively unchanged since we announced that project um, you know, at DockerCon three years back. Now, I mean, there have been some changes and there's been a lot of you know, improvement and polishing and refinement, uh, but the vision is largely unchanged. Docker, as of you know, their sort of recent reboot of, of uh, Swarm, had to kind of you know, comprehensively rethink their approach. You know, the, the, the later renditions of Swarm um, bore no resemblance to the earlier renditions of Swarm. There was a complete rewrite, embracing a lot of the core Kubernetes concepts. 
So I would say that, you know, on, in one regard, you know, Docker has absolutely understood the utility that Kubernetes represents and has moved decisively to bring some of that value to Swarm. On the other hand, I would say that it's several years uh, too late. You know, the, the Kubernetes community has had a tremendous amount of time to gather ahead of steam, to actually gather a tremendous base of vendor support, to operate in a truly open and vendor agnostic way. And people feel good about that. You know, like, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to underplay the significance that Google has written significantly less than 50%, well, not significantly, a little less than 50% of the code uh, on Kubernetes right now. And so, you know, my take is the following. Um, you know, Swarm is definitely moving in the right direction, and Docker has put lightning in a bottle from a developer management perspective. But unless they can replicate the depth of sophistication that, you know, like, you know, 50 of Google's best engineers, or however many are working on Kubernetes, you know, bring to the table, those are badass engineers. And, you know, however many of the Red Hat engineers bring to the table. And then, you know, the, the, the mixed contributions of a bunch of other people, it's an uphill fight. And it's not clear that unless that project is as legitimately open as Kubernetes is, that anyone really wants to get into it. So, um, you know, I think that based on the utilization statistics, we clearly see Kubernetes pulling ahead. Um, and I hope and I believe and I trust that Docker will gravitate towards the right solution for their customers because at the end of the day, they are tremendously developer and customer oriented. I, I agree with, with all of that. Um, you know, Kubernetes and the idea, ideas that go into Kubernetes derive directly from hands-on experience, um, building Borg and Omega, uh, and in, in some sense, even the, the predecessors to those. So like, Kubernetes is sort of a fourth generation system um, where we've taken a lot of the best ideas um, and dropped some of the really bad ones. Um, and, you know, I came to the Borg team um, six, seven years ago, and it took me a long time to understand some of the decisions that had been made in Borg because they were not obvious decisions, right? They were not the things that the designer or software engineer in me would have thought about. Um, or they, they ran counter to what I would have naturally done, uh, but they were done for reasons, right? And a lot of those things carry forward into Kubernetes, um, and I think that this is one of those things that, you know, I can't convince you of it. You just have to try it, and, and you'll see it, that eventually these, these patterns resonate for people um, in a way that you can't uh, fake. Um, the other part of this, uh, I mean, I agree with Craig that um, Docker... The recent, the, the Swarm Kit version of Swarm, uh, I don't think it's fair to call it that. Swarm Kit uh, embraces a lot of the same ideas uh, in Kubernetes, in fact, down to the same words in a lot of places. Um, and I think that's great. I think it's a big validation of uh, what we've been doing. Um, the thing that I point out to a lot of people is this is a bottomless pit of engineering work. Uh, we, we've been pouring engineers into this for years, uh, and we still haven't reached the bottom. Um, and so I, you know, I, I find it unfortunate that multiple organizations are pouring multiple engineers into multiple holes, right? Um, I, I feel like it, there is a bottom. There's got to be a bottom. Good Lord, there's got to be a bottom. But, uh, but, you know, we'll find it working together, right? We've got 1,100, almost 1,200 Kubernetes people, uh, you know, week in, week out, pounding away at this thing. Um, if there's going to be a bottom, it's going to be found there first. Yeah, I mean, I was pretty much going to say um, what, you know, Craig and, and Tim said about this. I, I think maybe a simple way to frame it would be that um, Docker's um, heart and soul is in the developer experience, and um, Kubernetes was built from years and years of sweat and blood in the operations experience, and um, perhaps that is, uh, you see that reflected in who is adopting those two projects. Um, and when you think about going into production, uh, it's, you have to involve the operations teams. Uh, hello. Oh, great. My name's Rob Hirschfeld. I'm with RackN. Uh, I've been involved with Docker and Kubernetes really from early, early days. One of the things that I think we're not talking about that's really important in the Docker experience is Docker Hub and shared image and the ability for people to download and quickly get images, control, per, control the chain of custody in their images and things like that. How do you see these movements and Docker's um, preeminence as the source of those, those images become 
in, you know, changing over time, how does it impact Kubernetes? I think I'm supposed to point you to uh, Chris Anschek's OCI panel. Uh, tomorrow is probably the uh, best place to talk about that, but uh, feel free. I can just jump in real quick. Um, I'll say that um, CoreOS is tackling um, you know, this problem through Quay, and um, specifically for the Kubernetes ecosystem, Quay just announced support for Kubernetes applications. And um, that, I think, is something that I have, I'm particularly interested in. Um, that's a lot of what the work we were doing with Red Spread um, is you know, thinking beyond just the image format, if you think of images as code, but also including um, you know, uh, configuration with that as well, and, and thinking through how, how we can share applications and defining what an application format even is. So. I mean, I, I think you need to kind of separate these things out. Um, there's, what is my repository that I deploy my image into that I can then acquire it from later? Um, and there's a lot of great technologies out there. Quay is one, uh, JFrog. Um, the cloud providers themselves are actually creating these, uh, these amazing um, technologies that are you know, well linked to their infrastructure. And you know, if I had one sort of significant complaint around Docker Hub, it, it's that it ties the source of the image to the hosting location. You really want the place that you're pulling a production image from to be close to your production systems. It makes a ton of sense for it to be embedded in your environment. And it also becomes a very natural control point for a lot of other capabilities. So using a you know, third party technology like JFrog or Quay or something like that in your environment just gives you a much more controlled narrative around the containers you want to run your production pieces out of. The second part of it is um, the provider ecosystem. And you know, in this way, in this regard, I, I absolutely wish Docker well. If they could become a you know a provider of clean, curated, well structured, user land um, component tree that you can piece together for your workloads, that would be great. Um, right now, I think there's a ton of work to be done there. I think you'll catch a disease if you uh, go and sort of just grab something of Docker Hub and deploy it. Um, you know, they're probably moving in a direction that makes a ton of sense, but it's something that is actually going to take a much broader community around. I'd love to see the ISV community start to rally around this kind of capability. I'd love to see a federated marketplace emerge. I'd love to see a community-oriented and driven um, repository that includes things like provenance and a lot of the other attribution needs that vendors, um, you know, well, that, that customers require um, emerging. So I think it's very important to separate those two things out. I, I think from a behavioral point of view, Hub is amazing. Um, it, it is this central place where you can find um, a wealth of interesting stuff. Um, it's also terrifying, right? There's a lot of interesting images on there that I don't really know what I'm going to get if I run it. Uh, and then there's, I mean, there's the core library, which is pretty reliable, and you can count on that being excellent stuff. And then there's a billion other people who have just uploaded whatever random crap that they've built up to it. Um, and in fact, I see a lot of people using Docker Hub as sort of the, a free FTP server. Uh, they put their stuff in a container image, they upload it to Docker Hub, and they tell their friends to download it, right? And, and they get free file hosting. Thanks, Docker. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because I think it really dilutes what Hub is good at. Um, but I have to echo what Craig said with you know, the Hub being at a central location is a real problem uh, for a lot of people. Like, the number one thing we get asked for people who are bringing up a new on-prem Kubernetes installation is how do I run a private registry, right? Um, the library is a fantastic starting place, but it's not where people want to put their own applications. And so they want their private thing because they want the security. Uh, they want their private thing because they need the performance. Just anecdotally, when we launched Kubernetes Alpha, I think version 0.19, uh, one of our alpha blockers was getting a caching Docker Hub proxy in place because Docker Hub's that. performance was so unreliable at that point that uh, you could vary you know, from something that would take four seconds to pull to something that would take four minutes to pull. Uh, and we had no real alternative. Um, and so we, you know, this was just a, a, a launch blocker for us. Um, now it's, it's much better these days. I, I don't mean to uh, say bad things about it. But I think it echoes the point that having something close is really important. I would love to see something like K end up in CNCF. In Okay, any other uh, questions for the panel? Um, well, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Hi, um, Alexander from uh, Ubisoft. 
Um, so my question is basically, um, how would you define um, Kubernetes currently, like, like it is today, and what it's becoming? Is it to you more like a cluster manager, a foundation for platform as a service? Uh, and do you think that in the future it could maybe replace uh, technologies like Mesos to support different kind of workloads, uh, whether it, it, it's big data or GPU and things like this? I think all of the above. Um, I mean, it is a basis for people to build platforms, right? It's a set of primitives is the, the way I tend to refer to it. It's, it's a bunch of primitives. You can use the primitives directly, and it is totally usable. I run my own stuff on Kubernetes, and, it, and it's, it's very usable. Um, or you can build up to a higher level of abstraction and get um, a lot more polish and a lot more shine uh, on what it is that you use with platforms like Deus, like uh, OpenShift. They build up, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that the primitives themselves aren't useful. Um, then, uh, you know, you can build from there. People end up building um, bespoke tools, right? Everybody ends up building their own script that wraps around Docker, uh, and people are building their own scripts that wrap around, wrap around Cube Control. Um, and I think that's completely okay. So, what is it today? Yeah, it's a container orchestrator. Yeah, it's a foundation for some of the more successful PaaSes that we're building today. Um, yes, it's a way to drive down the cost of operations for a variety of workloads. Um, so, you know, it's many things to different people. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's being embraced as a replacement for traditional DevOps tooling is, you know, is one of the key kind of use cases that I'm seeing. Um, and in the future, I think it's going to be a lot more than that. I think, you know, we have an opportunity as a community to build a legitimate distributed systems OS. We have an opportunity to create something that stitches together a large amount of wildly variable physical infrastructure and presents it to the application layer as logical infrastructure. I think we have an opportunity to create something that is an abstraction that separates the world of the cloud provider uh, from the world of the enterprise software vendor. I think we have a way to thwart, you know, the emergence of the cloud providers is effectively taking us back to the mainframe days of 1985, where instead of it being called IBM, it's now called Amazon, and, you know, Microsoft could be DEC, and Google could be Control Data or Tashio. I don't know, you can pick them, or you can flip them around. Um, it, it's a project that has tremendous potential and promise. Um, and I can tell you this, you know, as we looked, you know, five years out, I bet you a lot of packaged software is going to need to work in this environment. It's going to need to be able to deploy it in a massive cloud or somewhere close to the edge or in someone's data center or a little bit of both. And I'm hoping that Kubernetes becomes a platform for that. Yeah, um, I, I would say more of a meta commentary that the fact that we're answering your question with a bunch of different, you know, very large, broad, you know, broad statements means that um, it's still, this is still an ecosystem that is relatively new. Um, and I think um, we're, you know, um, you know, doing um, what we should, and we sh what we should be doing in terms of um, discussing what exactly is Kubernetes. And I think we've sort of touched on that topic um, a lot throughout this, uh, throughout this panel, but um, just, uh, hearing our, you know, my co-panelists uh, answer your question with um, basically like five different things plus like their hopes and aspirations for what this project could become, you know, I, I think there's a lot of work. To be clear, that's the same stuff we told Urs when we, <laughs> when we kicked this project off. That hasn't changed, right? <laughs> So I feel like I dodged the last part of the question uh, with respect to other workloads and frameworks, um, and Mesos in particular. Um, I think it's interesting because Mesos uh, does fill this space right now, especially when it comes to things like big data. Um, but I think that Kubernetes is catching up in a lot of ways. Um, we've been building a lot of primitives for that sort of workload. Um, we have existence proof in the form of Google uh, that shows that you can run those sorts of workloads on a system like Kubernetes, on a unified system like Kubernetes, without the need to fragment into vertical frameworks like Mesos does. Um, and I think um, above and beyond that, we have a, uh, a certain inertia that Mesos is is lacking for whatever reasons. Uh, the community around Kubernetes uh, is incredible, um, unlike you know very many projects in the world. 
And I think that that gives us the ability to overcome any obstacle that we're going to face, right? Now, we could run headlong into the wall, um, but I really think that uh, the community is, is adept enough that we're gonna be able to jump whatever obstacles uh, are in our path. Um, and so to that end, yes, I think we could uh, replace systems like Mesos. Now that said, Mesos has a very established user base. Um, it's a very dedicated user, so I don't think we're actually literally going to replace Mesos. I think that there are customers out there who are evaluating the two against each other, and if you extrapolate and draw out the trajectory, um, I think Kubernetes com can come out on top. To be fair though, I think Mesos is, Mesos is like a library for building distributed apps, right? And then you have to use a framework like Marathon in order to be able to use Mesos. And then on top of that, you have DCOS. And then on top of that, you have DCOS Enterprise, which really, I think, is the best comparison to Kubernetes. Um, and so um, definitely have um, you know, different layers of, of technology, I think, in that discussion. I'm going to give uh, Mackenzie the last word there. I would uh, like to very much thank uh, CoreOS and Google for sponsoring this event and assembling our panel this evening. I'd like to thank uh, Craig McLucky from Heptio and uh, Mackenzie Burnett from CoreOS and Tim Hawken from Google. So uh, and thank you all for attending. We have uh, uh, some food, so please help yourself and uh, get another drink and uh, we'll all be uh, mingling around. So please stay for a while. Thanks very much. Thanks.